Uh, we're going to get into this word tonight, and I'm excited to share it with you. Uh, I need you to share. I need you to share. I need you to share. Uh, Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you that you're the God who not only cares for us, but you take care of us. And so we rest in that tonight. Father, we thank you for everyone who's coming on, everyone who's logging on, everyone who's viewing tonight. Father, I pray even for those who will watch on the replay, Father, that you would open their hearts and spirits, uh, that they would be fertile soil, that as the seed of this word is released, that it will be cultivated. And at the time that is right, you will cause a harvest to come forth. Thank you that your word shall not return to your void, but it shall accomplish everywhere it's being sent. Father, release a fresh anointing for teaching and preaching tonight. Father, we give you all the glory, all the praise, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys, tonight for joining us. Uh, listen, I, I'm here for round two tonight. Amen. Uh, we had some technical difficulties this morning. Amen. But I was determined not to allow uh, anything to rob you of this word tonight. So I pray uh, that you uh, will be blessed by it. Make sure you share uh, with somebody tonight. I want to ask you to join me in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 6 tonight. John chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. Again, that's John chapter 6. Verses 5 through 13. I'm going to be looking in the New Living Translation. Once again, if I can get uh, some of my good uh, copious note takers to help us out in the chat, put John chapter 6, verses 5 through 13 in the New Living Translation. And it says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Verse 7 says, Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Verse 12 says, after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. If you do me a favor, help us get our uh, subject out tonight. Lessons from a lad's lunch. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Lessons from a lad's lunch. More and more, ladies and gentlemen, organizations and companies are hosting events known as Lunch and Learns. You may have heard of it, but if you're unfamiliar with the concept, a Lunch and Learn is essentially an informal training session where lunch is provided for the attendees. The sessions are intended to bring those within the organization together for the purpose of collaborating and learning with the ultimate objective of personal team and organizational development. And in our text tonight, Jesus is hosting somewhat of an impromptu lunch and learn of his own in which he uses a lad's lunch to create an opportunity for team collaboration and the personal development of his disciples. And so today and tonight, you're getting exclusive access to Jesus's lunch and learn so that you and I can also learn the lessons from this lad's lunch. And so I want to get right into the text. When we see verse five, it says, Jesus saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? So we see the assignment. In case you missed it, it's right there in the text. The assignment is to feed all these people in this huge crowd. And now I, I see at least three things about this assignment that we can gather from the text. 
First of all, it is a substantial assignment. The crowd is apparently huge. So it is a substantial assignment. Secondly, it is a selfless assignment. It is a selfless assignment. Notice Jesus only speaks of his concern for the crowd being fed and makes no mention of food for himself. So first of all, it's a substantial assignment. It's a selfless assignment. But then thirdly, it is a shared assignment. It's a shared assignment. Jesus asked, can, where can we buy bread to feed all these people. The emphasis on we. And these three observations regarding the assignment in the text actually provide for us a very real and very relevant rationale for why we should get involved when the church comes together to serve outside of the walls of the church. Because first of all, it gives us an opportunity to be selfless and to think of others rather than focusing on ourselves. Secondly, because it is typically a substantial assignment that alone suggests that it should be a shared assignment uh, in which each of us comes together to carry our respective corners. Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, the master teacher has given an assignment. So first of all, we see the assignment, but then I need you to see something in verses six through nine. In verses six through nine, we see the assessment of available assets is right there in the text. We see the assessment of available assets. Listen, uh, the Bible says he was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew in verse 8 said, Simon Peter's brother spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? So let's get into it. First of all, verse 6 tells us that the question that Jesus poses in verse 5 is really just a test for Philip. Listen, if this is blessing you, I really want you to share this. Uh, it, it, it's really just a test for Philip. Now, it's important for us to understand tonight that God, I need you to hear me, God does not ask questions to gain information, but rather God asks questions to give illumination. You might have missed it. I'll run it back. I said that God does not ask questions to gain information, but rather God asks questions to give illumination. In other words, any time that God decides to ask a question, he's getting ready to reveal something significant. Can I argue my case tonight? In Genesis, when God asked Adam, where are you? It was not because he was unable to find Adam. Him, but it was so that Adam would have to acknowledge and admit where he was. When God asked Eve, what have you done? He knew exactly what she had done, but he needed Eve to realize how badly she had just messed up. In the middle of their wrestling match, God asked Jacob, what is your name? Well, he already knew that his name was Jacob, but the question was the perfect segue to change the subject to a conversation about names since he was about to change his name from Jacob to Israel. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am, the streets had already been talking. So Jesus knew the word on the street, but he was using the initial question to force his disciples to think about his follow up question, which was, who do you say? that I am because he needed them to have a certain level of clarity and conviction about who they were following. All I'm trying to tell you is that God does not ask questions to gain information, but he asks questions to give illumination. And you know what you would discover, ladies and gentlemen, you would discover that you will learn more about yourself from God's questions than you you ever will from man's answers. Text says 
The question was merely a test for Philip because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Now, verses 6 and 7 make it very apparent that Philip had no clue what to do. But we should never make the mistake of confusing us knowing what to do or not knowing what to do with God not knowing what to do. I didn't say that like I wanted to, so I'm going to say it again. We should never make the mistake of confusing us not knowing what to do with God not knowing what to do. Listen, God is never somewhere hoping that you and I have a plan because he seemed to can't come up with one himself. And I don't know of uh, the problem you're facing that necessitates a plan tonight, but I do know that God already knows what he's going to do about it. He already knows how he's going to handle it. He already knows how he's going to work it out. He already knows the right time to put the plan in into motion. Come on, Jeremiah, help me make this point tonight, for I know the plans I have for you. The message translation says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Y'all, I'm trying to tell you, we serve a God who already knows what to do. He already knows what to do. Now, now, if you look at the text, I'm trying to hurry tonight. This is supposed to be the recap. Uh, if you look at the text, Philip does not say anything that was incorrect. However, his input was incomplete. See, Philip's contribution to the dialogue focused on what was absent. On the other hand, Andrew's contribution to the conversation focused on what was available. And while we must always be cognizant of what is not in order to optimize any situation, someone must be able to identify and see the potential of what is. See, if the conversation had ended after what Philip said, that would have also been the end of the story. But thank God that somebody had something different to add to the conversation, which allowed the story to continue on. And who am I talking to tonight who can pray? Praise God that your story did not end after the first thing that was said, nor the first assessment that was made about you. But God spoke a different word in your spirit or sent someone in your life to add to the conversation. And now you realize that though you may have been deemed insufficient by some, God has shown you that you are absolutely sufficient and regardless of what might be missing you are enough to be used as a part of God's divine purpose and plan in the earth. See, You see for a harvest to be realized a seed must first be recognized. I'll run it back again. For a harvest to be realized a seed must first be recognized and who knows just like this little lad's lunch your life, your gift, what's in your hand, what's in your head may be a seed that produces a miracle for the masses. Is this not the story of Jesus, y'all? The stone that the builders reject becomes the chief cornerstone, the same Jesus who emerges from the nothingness of Nazareth becomes the seed that produces a harvest of salvation and liberation for the entire world. And in this year of optimization, we've declared it, we cannot allow what is not to take away our spirit of optimism. While we wait on the manifestation of exceeded expectations, According to Ephesians 3 and 20, I need somebody who would determine along with me that I'm going to make the best of it until he does the rest of it. I need somebody to put that in the comments tonight. I'm going to make the best of it until he does the rest of it. I'm not going to pout. I'm not going to sulk. I'm not going to complain, but I'm going to trust God and know that he's not done. He's not through. He's still working. 
waiting, he's still moving, and while I'm waiting on the manifestation of exceeded expectation, I'm going to make the best of it until he does the rest of it. Somebody ought to give him glory right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to make the best of it until he does the rest of it. So first, first of all, we see the assignment. Second of all, we see the assessment of available assets. But then number three, we see the approach. We see the approach is right here in verses 10 and 11. Verse 10, Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. I, I don't know who this is for, but, but can somebody just release in the atmosphere, we all going to eat, we all going to eat, we all going to eat, we all going to eat. I, I don't know who that was for, I just, but, but release that in your atmosphere. Now, now verse 10 Says Jesus says, tell the people, sit down. I need you to see something, though. I need, I need my good, I need my good studious students to see something. We we go from verse nine, where Andrew says, "There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd?" The next thing we know, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is telling the people to sit down. Jesus does not even acknowledge what Andrew says. Andrew said, we got a boy with five loaves, two fish, but what is that? Jesus doesn't even acknowledge what he said. And I noticed something, y'all. I noticed something about Jesus. Jesus is kind of funny, y'all. Jesus is kind of funny because I noticed he tends to do this. Where else did he do this? I, I, do you remember on the boat, when Jesus is on the boat with the disciples, Jesus is asleep, the disciples going crazy, they're fearful and afraid, thinking they're about to die in the storm. They wake Jesus up, Jesus gets up, like, what's the matter with y'all? And they say, don't you care that we perish? I want you to read that when, when we off this, when we off the stream, because notice, Jesus never responds to that question. Just like he didn't respond to Andrew's question. Just like the next thing you knew on the boat, Jesus just got up, moved into action, rebuked the wind, said, peace be still. Right here in the text, Jesus ignores what Andrew says and just moves into action and says, tell the people to sit down. I, I think I found something, y'all. Jesus has a tendency to ignore faithless inquisitions. Did y'all hear what I said? Jesus has a tendency to ignore faithless inquisitions. It's not that he's negligent, but it's because he responds to faith. He's attracted to faith. And he says, rather than address and dignify your faithless inquisition with a response, I'll just get up, move into action, and do what I'm going to do for you to prove that I care for you because what you just said, you're talking crazy. I'm not even going to respond to that. My response is going to be what I do for you. And how many know whenever God gets to doing for you, things have got to get better. He says, Andrew, you're talking crazy. I'm not even going to respond to that, but watch what I do. Oh, my God. And listen, somebody in this season, you're going to have to follow Jesus' example because if there are going to be some faithless inquisitions that come your way. How you going to do that? How you think you're going to start that business? How you think you're going to have that car? How you think you're going to get approved for that job? What's so special about some faithless inquisitions? And don't you respond. You just got to do like Jesus. Ignore the faithless, faithless inquisition and tell them, just watch me. You don't believe? Just watch me. You don't understand? Just watch me. Jesus ignored the faithless inquisition and just moved into action. 
So we see the approach of Jesus. But then I need you to see the accomplishment. Right there in verses 12 and 13 says, after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. Can I tell somebody something tonight? The word for somebody is don't waste a thing in this season. Everything that God has put in your hands is useful for something. You may not know what for yet, but God is saying, don't waste nothing. Somebody put in the comments, I'm not wasting nothing. I know that ain't good English, but it's good theology. I ain't wasting nothing. I ain't wasting nothing. Everything God gave me, I'm going to use it. Everything God gave me, I'm going to redeem it. Everything God put in my hand, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to put it to work. I'm going to put it to use. Somebody say, don't waste nothing in this season. He says, gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Watch me now. They picked up the scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Now, if you do a studious review of verse 13, it might be more clear to you if you look at a few different Bible translations. But if you do a studious review of verse 13, you will notice that only bread was left over. There are, there are fish and bread but the only thing that was left over was bread, no fish. Now, y'all, I can't prove this. I can't prove this. But I, I'm thinking it had to be some of us out there because we ain't hardly about to leave no fish behind. You know what I'm saying? Listen, well, okay, all right. When is the last time? When is the last time you went to a cookout and some fish was left over at the end. I'll wait. I'll wait. When was the last time you went to a cookout and fish was left over? Listen, they'll have everything else. But fish, no. Nah, Y'all got any more fish left? No, nah, they killed the fish. Now, I don't know what you can do with that. I mean, I don't know that there's no spiritual import in that. I just thought it was an interesting observation that the 12 baskets of leftovers was only bread, no fish. Who knew? Who knew? All right, I got to get serious. I got to get serious. But look at what was accomplished. Look at what was accomplished. They went from how is this going to feed all these people to make sure you don't waste all these leftovers. Y'all see that accomplishment? They went from how is this going to feed all these people to make sure you don't waste all these leftovers. And it happened, ladies and gentlemen, because while some were focused on what was not there, Jesus saw the potential in what was there. And once it got in his hands, y'all, it was on and popping. And I may be talking to somebody tonight who has come to the place where you don't know what to do with what's in your hand. It may be too heavy. It may be too complicated. Maybe it's just not adding up. If that's you, allow me to recommend getting it out of your hands and putting it in the Lord's hands because he is the God who already knows what to do. Listen, somebody listening to me has learned the blessing of putting it in the Lord's hands. You've learned how to get your peace by putting it in the Lord's hands. No wonder the Michael McKay wrote the song that said, all in his hands, I put it all in his hands, all of my burdens, all of my problems. If I have a question, I put it all in his hands. No matter the problem, I put it all in his hands because I know that he can solve them. He knows what to do. I put it all in his hands. This and that, that and this. 
Come on, some of y'all, we're my choir people. This, this, and that, 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 and this. Come on, I put it all in his hands because I understand that once it gets in his hands, there's no better place for it to be. I just came to encourage somebody tonight. If you don't know what to do with what's in your hands, you put it in the hands of the one who already knows what to do. I'm closing tonight, but even Jesus himself, before he could fully accomplish what he was sent here to accomplish by becoming the sacrificial seed that saved the masses, uh, he could not accomplish his task until he himself Self said, Father, unto thy hands I commit my spirit. And when God, Jesus put his life in God's hands, when he put his spirit in God's hands, that's when he became the savior of the world. That's when he became the one who uh, reconciled the world to himself. Oh, somebody, listen tonight. You need to know that you can make it. You need to know that you can stand no matter what may come your way. When your life is in his hands, you can make it because he already knows what to do. I don't listen. I don't know what you're dealing with tonight, but I need to let somebody know he already knows what to do. He already knows how to handle it. He already knows what you need. He already has the plan. He's not thinking of one. He's not trying to figure out one. He knows what to do. Put your life. Put your situation. Put your assignment in God's hands. That's the lesson from the lad's lunch. Listen, I want to pray with you before we leave here tonight that you would be able to release what's in your hand, put it in God's hands and not take it back until he says you can have it. Father, I pray for your people tonight. Bless them. Cause them to trust you at another level. Father, many of them have had things that they've been trying to handle and trying to accomplish on their own. But Father, we thank you that you are not only able, but you're willing to help. Father, I pray that you would teach us to cast our cares on you because you care for us. And Father, tonight I pray that you would cause those who are trying to juggle and handle and manage what's too heavy for them. Father, tonight, push them, cause them to know that they can let go, let you have it, and let you have your way. Father, we thank you tonight that whenever we put it in your hands, we can trust that you know what to do. So, Father, give us that peace. Give us that comfort in knowing tonight that you will not mess it up. You will not break it. You will not mismanage it. But you will do the best thing with it. And whatever that is, help us to trust you that you know what you're doing. Father, we love you. We give you glory and give you praise. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, I pray that you were blessed uh, by this tonight. Listen, if you were, I want you to do me a huge favor. I want you to share, 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 tag some people so that they can benefit from uh, this word tonight. All right? Well, we love you. God bless you. And we will see you real soon. God bless.